joining us as I speak. Um, my name is Suzanne Jeffrey, and I am chair of the Campaign Against Climate Change and I chair our trade union group as well. Um, as I speak, I can see that people are arriving uh, onto the webinar, so that's lovely to see the numbers uh, going up. And we are also live streaming to Facebook, um, so hopefully we have people joining us on Facebook um, as, as well. Um, I'm going to say a few words by uh, way of introduction to the webinar itself. And then I am going to say a few words about our speakers um, tonight. Uh, really, really delighted um, to have the panel that we have with us tonight. Uh, for our, our participants, uh, for our attendees to the webinar, um, just to let you know now that we're going to take questions via the Q&A and via the chat. Um, so please please do put your questions into chat or into the into the Q&A and we'll probably take our questions um, in between speakers as well as to all of the speakers after the, all of them have finished um, their introductions. Um, so the title of tonight's webinar hosted by Campaign Against Climate Change Trade Union Group and Campaign Against Climate Change is No Going Back, Climate Justice Jobs in an Era um, of Covid Crisis. I think um, there are many people having similar conversations to the conversation that we are having now. I don't think there can be any more important conversations for us to have. Um, and a conversation that, that, that needs to have some point in terms of mobilisation, organisation and activism um, across the trade union movement and across wider um, in society. The Covid crisis has been a serious public health crisis. Um, the impact for hundreds of thousands of people, millions we're getting up to now, um, has been tragic in terms of a loss of life. I think during this crisis we've seen um, really important things happen. We've seen how society can transition, things that we were told was not possible, factories that can suddenly be repurposed to providing things that are actually vital to society, for the social interests of society. Um, we've also seen our environment change not fundamentally, but we've seen our air become cleaner um, as aspects of our lives have, have changed temporarily. Uh, we've seen emissions reduce, albeit temp temporarily. Most crucially, I think we've seen who the key workers are in our society and the work that matters um, to make a collective society work for, work for, all, for all of us. Um, and we've also seen that there's money available. So we've seen transitions happen, uh, that we were told were not possible on the speed at which they have been possible. Uh, we've seen people change their behaviour when we, when the crisis has been explained and people feel that their actions, not everybody it has to be said, are impacting um, for the benefit of the whole of, of society. But just to finish my comments here, I think what we've also seen is we've seen those people who are going to uh, provide an obstacle to those changes or who have really dragged their feet when they have been necessary um, on our pushing for us to uh, change back to a business as usual uh, way of organising society far, far, far too quickly. And for those of you who have just tuned out of one press conference and into this webinar, I think that we have seen very much that the interests of a small elite in society will continue to be prioritised over, prioritised over the interests of the vast majority of us and of the solutions that we need to put in place for this public health crisis, but also for the climate crisis. So to finish up, before I introduce our speakers, there is the interconnectedness of the crisis, the COVID crisis, the other crises, uh, where we have seen the interests of big business, of profit, prioritised over the needs of the majority of society. That's exactly the same thing that has happened around the climate crisis. But my final comment to this is the climate crisis absolutely has not gone away. Um, it continues, it continues at pace. And therefore, having a solution to the climate crisis as indeed we've talked about the need for real solutions that benefit all of us in terms of the, the COVID crisis become more urgent, as urgent as ever. Um, so there should be no going back, but we have to talk about what kind of future we now need to fight together to build. And I think be aware of the forces that are really ranged, ranged against us in, in that battle. So welcome everybody. We have uh, 
a large number of people joining us today and a wonderful panel. Um, for Q&As, please put them in the Q&A or in the chat, whatever is easiest for you. And thanks also, just before I introduce the speakers, to Claire and to Lewis who have helped to organise this meeting. Um, we have with us today Sharon Burroughs, who's the General Secretary of the ITUC, the International Trade Union Confederation. Uh, welcome, Sharon, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, and we have Asad Rahman, who's the uh, Executive Director of War on Want and has a long history in the climate and environmental and climate justice movement. So thanks, Asad, for joining us today. Really, really appreciate it. Um, we have Sean Vernell, um, a member of the UCU um, National Executive Committee and uh, plays a leading role in the um, um, UCU FE um, um, uh, part of, of the union as well. So welcome, Sean. And Sean also has been an author of a number of books um, on young people, uh, employment, um, and uh, the kind of opportunities that young people need. And then finally joining us today, I know hot from watching that press conference, so maybe John will have more to say on that later. later. Um, it's John MacDonald MP, a former, former shadow uh, Chancellor um, and uh, John, you're very, very welcome. I'm so pleased that you could join us um, today. And uh, like millions, no doubt, we're wishing that um, you were currently um, sat in number 11 at this moment, at this moment in, in time. But welcome, John, and thanks for all of the work that you've done um, thus far. So I'm going to um, start this evening's uh, webinar by handing over um, to Sharon. Um, Sharon is, as I say, General Secretary, but Sharon also did um, amazing work, I think, in, in popularising what remains a really crucial statement for us in the, tra the trade union movement, um, which is there are no jobs on a dead planet and therefore uh, the trade union movement has to really rise and be at the forefront uh, uh, of um, being the leadership uh, of tackling the climate and environmental crisis. So Sharon, welcome and um, off you go. Thank you very much, Suzanne, and uh, to my fellow panelists. Uh, I look forward to listening to you. But uh, to all of the participants, can I say there is nothing more important than looking at these crises in convergence, because we already had a convergence of crises. We had massive inequality. It was driving uh, uh, an age of anger with civil unrest and distrust in uh, democracy. And it was already recognised, not just as a social risk, but as an economic risk prior to COVID-19. We have, of course, the climate emergency. And as Suzanne said, it will remain a crisis until we deal with it, because this is about uh, the challenge to save a planet for uh, the human race itself. So it's an extinction crisis that we can't avoid. And indeed, Suzanne, there are no jobs on a dead planet. So we have to build employment now on a living planet. Uh, progress on every indicator has stalled for women. And of course, violence against women uh, remains largely unchecked. And we've seen the horrid uh, tragedy of rising domestic violence during the, the lockdown period that we've all faced. The... Um, and of course, racism and xenophobia are on the rise with uh, indeed it's a tool of fear for far right politics. And uh, that's the basis of their um, attraction, sadly, because they generate fear in a community about each other. And multilateralism is in crisis as people lose trust in globalization and international institutions. Now COVID-19 has just exposed much of this in an even more stark way. It's a health crisis, uh, but first and foremost, and you cannot put any measure of economy above saving lives. So it's, it will be characterised, I'm sure, as one of the greatest acts of solidarity globally in our lifetime, where people have given up civic freedoms and livelihoods, indeed, uh, to save lives, and that's as it should be. But we can't ignore the devastation. And while we were not happy with the world we had, we cannot uh, continue to uh, pretend that we want to build back the world we had. We have to actually create a recovery and a resilience that goes to the heart of all of these areas of crisis. 
this uh, this crisis, though, on a social front, of course, we know that uh, some 300 million jobs in the formal sector or equivalent full-time hours could be lost. And we know that 1.6 billion workers in the informal economy have either lost livelihoods, are at risk of live, losing livelihoods, and many of them uh, facing destitution, even starvation. And of course, Assad, I'm sure, will have something to say about, uh, about that. But I particularly want to stress that because we can't think of the global uh, workforce without understanding that 60% of the global workforce has actually is now working in the informal economy. And that includes all of the struggles the trade unions in the UK and other countries have had to include freelancers, independent uh, workers, uh, 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 platform workers, all of those people who fall outside of the, uh, or we call them non-standard forms of work, but fall outside the guarantee of direct employment. And of course, without uh, uh, all workers being covered by social protection, then you know the outcome is just devastation. So one of our major demands going forward, and I'll come back to it, is a global social protection fund. And I want to put it right up front because while we uh, fight in every country to actually uh, make sure people are included, are supported with income, with uh, sickness benefits, with uh, employment guarantees, and, uh, and of course we have to get to job creation, then we can tell you that uh, in the $10 trillion projected to be uh, uh, committed to spending now, probably 20 trillion by the end of the crisis, it would take just 37 billion to actually cover universal social protection for the 28 poorest countries, everybody, in terms of health and income. It's a drop in the ocean, but can we get enough governments yet in this uh, crisis of multilateralism to lift their sights above? Uh, the uh, borders no. And again, while I say, of course, our fight is domestic, we can never misunderstand the nature of this and other areas of crisis. Because if we don't have a global solidarity and recovery isn't about building resilience, including for everybody, then whatever the next crisis is, will simply come around and devastate an interconnected world again. So, I wanted to, uh, to say to you that as we, we've, we've seen this crisis with three phases, of course, the first wave of crisis, looking after people, paid sick leave, income protection, wage guarantees, uh, retention of jobs, and of course, access to health, and indeed uh, uh, to, uh, um, uh, to social protection. But we also know that as we move from this crisis phase, not over yet, and we're going to face, you know, second waves and possibly third waves, we know. And of course, it hasn't even reached its peak in some of uh, the, uh, the continents yet, that this is still playing out. But even as we look at the things we've achieved, the unions and society have achieved in terms of advancing the social contract, because part of our demand is a new social contract. And when you've seen people get statutory sick leave, income guarantees, access to health expanded in many countries, we need to keep those. And then we need to fill in the gaps to make sure that people are not excluded. So I'm very, uh, um, uh, John and I don't know each other personally, but we have friends in common and I'm in admiration of his work. And so I know that he'll pick up these arguments, but as we move into the recovery phase, we have to be conscious of what do we take with us from what we've gained in the crisis? What do we build into recovery? And how does that give us a resilience for the next wave of crisis? Because whatever it is, extreme weather events from climate uh, devastation, whether it's another pandemic, whether it's simply a collapse of supply chains, which we're seeing now and some of them won't come back, whether it's the shift in uh, economy uh, from a slump in demand or from new technologies, which of course we're facing the, the challenge of the best and worst of as well. We have to manage a recovery and we have to fight for a recovery that
that builds resilience. So just a few of the things that are on our recovery agenda. We, of course, want uh, indeed uh, job protection and job creation. And some of that will go to new areas where we will have to share work for periods of time in some sectors. So maximising wages, even as we look at reduced working hours. And in some sectors, those reduced working hours may become the norm. But all these things have to be negotiated with the union so people feel the trust in that. We, uh, we know that you can create jobs and actually investing in enabling green infrastructure, in, uh, in um, industry policy, vital for climate, but also for development, too long constrained by the shortcomings of the WTO and the liberalisation of trade with no thought about how to balance it. And of course, uh, the, uh, the investing in care. We know you can create jobs. We know you can share the responsibilities of society and the economy, but we have to make sure that that's on the agenda. We have to look at, at income from a different perspective. We fought for minimum living wages all around the world. You know, it's on the European agenda. And of course, we see that not in contest with collective bargaining, but in countries like yours and others as the very floor on which you build collective bargaining. Certainly in my country, amongst the highest minimum wages in the world, but it's kept a basic economy alive with social protection that uh, you, know, you cannot uh, deny, even though many will try. And then, of course, we want to see once and for all regulated, responsible business conduct. When you look at the dehumanising exploitation of our supply chains, and I walk those supply chains, they will break your heart. And as much as we fought against the dehumanisation of them, we're now working with business to try and keep some of them alive because it's about millions and millions of jobs for people in developing economies even as we know both demand and technology will shift many of the sectors. So that's got to be all part of it. And of course we want, um, you know, occupational health and safety has come to the fore and uh, we've been fighting to get occupational health and safety as an essential um, standard, a, a core labour standard at the ILO. It's time. It's absolutely time. And then of course we want a new standard on biological hazards way beyond time as well. But we're going to need government friends and that will take unions and society really campaigning about this. But no one should go to work or go to a public place and expect that they're going to lose their life as a result of simply living. Um, I would say that our three front lines stack up because we want to see, of course, regulation of that vulnerable labour market. And last year, we negotiated a labour protection floor for all workers. It's very simple. If every worker, regardless of their employment contract, and we can fight out the various issues in court after that, but if they all had uh, fundamental rights, OCH health and safety, a minimum living wage, a wage on which you could live with dignity, and uh, maximum hours of work, we would put a floor under all work. And of course, if that's married with social protection, plus a just transition for climate and technology and a transformative agenda for women and particularly, you know, investment in the care economy, we create a different future. And that means we also have to deal with tax because we can never again let our public services be underfunded. And I might add the irony for us is that many of the lowest paid workers in the world, particularly women in health and services, are actually now uh, the very frontline workers on who we rely for their courage to service our lives. We also know that climate action and the NDCs are vital. So even if they delay the COP, which is the word on the street, then we need to make sure that governments aren't let off the hook with those nationally defined contributions that include just transition measures. But it also means a transition for every sector. So as we build that recovery, we need to make sure all our sectors, our industrial sectors, our service sectors, are actually built on, uh, on jobs that are uh, climate friendly. And of course, that will take some multilateral. We don't have time for it today, but it will take some brave multilateral decisions about in investment in, in um, 
in industry policy and either shared or open source technology or border adjustment schemes, carbon pricing and so on. Difficult, often painful for the trade union movement, but we have to get this right in a new and balanced uh, approach to trade. And I can tell you the WTO is not fit for purpose. And again, we don't have time for that tonight either. But if we want to redesign multilateralism, let's do it now. We want to see debt relief. We just want to see debt tackled from a different basis altogether. And I'd love sometime, John, to talk to you about this. But we can take a reset on debt. We've already said to the IMF and the World Bank when they were uh, listening to the arguments from a whole lot of us about debt relief for the poorest countries, yes, we won 12 months. But if we don't eradicate structural reform and build back investment as the condition on the SDGs, which go to the heart of employment and climate and all the other areas, health and education, then we're not serious about development and we're not serious about the nature of, uh, of investment. But there's a bigger question around reset on debt in, in total, and we have some ideas on that. And as I said, reform and multilateralism. So in conclusion, I would say the ITC's three front lines that the union movement has endorsed globally First of all, a new social contract. The social contract broke down in the 80s as we saw hyper-globalisation simply be based on exploitation and the breakdown in the labour market. And we need to, to actually rebuild with a, uh, a regulation that actually gives all of the things I've said some sort of credence in an articulated and guaranteed new social contract, globally, nationally and locally. We, uh, we already have uh, a front line on uh, climate and just transition, and we're going to bring the two things together in recovery in a, in a day, global day of action on June 24th. I hope you'll back us in with a climate and employment conversation in every workplace. So we're asking employers to join us for a conversation in the workplace about climate and employment proofing our workplaces for the future. Francis O'Grady is absolutely on the case here for the TUC and, uh, and of course, we have many leaders. In fact, I wanted to quote something Francis said. She said, we've built hospitals in days. We've had to radically transform the way we live and work within days. I think we've run out of excuses about the ability to create a carbon-free economy. And I would add to that, we've run out of excuses about building a future on uh, what for the one percent and not for the 99 percent and our third front line is in fact uh, rebuilding trust in democracy you don't have a new uh, social contract we're not giving young people and indeed those of us who are in other generations absolute hope and trust in governance and accountability of government for all of the things we've talked about then you won't build re you won't rebuild trust in democracy, and the far right will win the arguments every time because our politicians, who are more progressive in thought, wherever they might be on the political spectrum, are too timid to take on the the global corporate power that has indeed set us up. And you just have to look at why competition's not being used against companies like uh, Amazon and uh, unfair competition, and that will tell you everything about a lack of courage. And John, I don't put you in that basket. I too wish, as Suzanne said, you were in one of those uh, numbered uh, houses. I will just finish by quoting something that I think, I didn't say it, I wish I had, but Arundhati Roy said, historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us, or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. And I know you are, so I congratulate you and I can say to you, we can build recovery and resilience for everybody if we have the power of people and, of course, trade unions, workers' power behind us. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. <clears throat> yeah.
And this is the thing that we really miss from our virtual meetings. Or oh, I, I, the, the, hand, the thumbs up doesn't do the same uh, for me. But uh, thank you, Sharon. Thanks so much for that. Um, there's over 200 uh, people on the web webinar at this moment in time. I think we're having a few problems in terms of streaming to Facebook. Hopefully, we can get those sorted out. So, if you have friends who are trying to uh, get onto the Facebook, uh, tell them that we're trying to get it sorted out. And that was a great way um, to finish, Sharon, uh, your contribution. I'm, there's so many questions coming up in the chat. Could I ask our speakers just to keep an eye on the chat and if there are particular things that are directed at them or they, they feel it would be useful for them to address, please do. Um, and I'm very pleased, Sharon, to have brought uh, an introduction via this webinar between you and, and John, and I hope that will lead to some very fruitful work uh, coming out of this, this webinar. So that's, that's a big achievement uh, in the first instance. Um, so I'm going to move, um, I think I'm going to move on um, and then maybe just take a couple of questions, but I, I think I'll keep the, the speakers going um, at this moment in time. So I'm going to move to um, our side, Sharon, a number of times. And in the chat, uh, Green New Deal is mentioned. Um, Sharon mentioned about the Global South. I mean, it's clear whatever the solutions are, they cannot reproduce and replicate the global inequalities or the long history of colonialism, imperialism, uh, resource extraction to the benefit of small minority elites in the West. Um, and I think Assad will um, speak to that. He's not only um, executive director of War on Want, but has also worked with uh, Naomi Klein's LEAP, uh, really framing what a global Green New Deal would look like. So welcome Assad, as ever, very pleased to have you with us and um, off you go. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope you can hear me now. I was having some audio problems. Yeah, you can yeah. hear me. But keep it, keep it loud, Asa, because it's quite I will, loud. I will keep it loud, sorry. <laughs> um, so first, thank you for the kind invitation, Joanne, and always a pleasure to be on a panel with both uh, Sharon and John. Um, well, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, you know, it said, uh, uh, also using an Aaron Dutty quote, since uh, Aaron Dutty's, uh, uh, we've all been on webinars recently with Aaron Dutty. She said that, you know, the corona pandemic is, is an x-ray on our societies, and it exposes an economic system unable to meet the needs of the people on our planet. And that's, of course, always been our understanding of climate. Uh, climate has never been a simple about an issue of carbon. It's always been about an unequal global system, which has happily sacrificed as part of its logic, people both in the global south, overwhelmingly, of course, but also in the global north, in the pursuit of profit for the richest in the world. And, and of course, like corona, climate has left those least responsible carrying the heaviest burden of this. Now, I don't need to start by this by talking about, you know, the killer floods and droughts and famines that happened at, at just at one degree warming around the planet. We don't really need to talk about how, you know, I mean, how all of these crises are compounding each other. People probably remember over the summer, India's biggest, fifth biggest city, Chennai, ran out of water. Uh, it's predicted within the next decade that 40% of India's 1.3 billion people will be without access to fresh water. And of course, the corona pandemic has also shown us migrant workers walking thousands of kilometers, left destitute, both by the collapse of supply chains and, of course, the unequal societies in which we exist. And, you know, the story is exactly the same. I could go on about, you know, the challenges in the continent of Africa where people are facing drought. Uh, huge uh, droughts of famines in, in, in southern Africa, in the Horn of Africa, facing uh, a, 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 a locusts, uh, terrible sort of impacts on food production, and of course the, 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 the crisis of corona. And in every part of the world, we're seeing climate change, its fingertips have exposed the existing inequalities of our world. And, uh, you know, and of course our starting point is a world you know, after years of neoliberalism and structural adjustments and austerity have literally in so many places dismantled the welfare state, hollowed out our health systems. Um, you know, and it's not simply been exposed by Corona. If you remember when the cyclones hit Mozambique uh, last year, you know, a million people were lifted on the brink of starvation, not because of the, the cyclones themselves, it's because over decades, the global north through first colonialism and then the wars of imperialism, then resource extraction, has hollowed out Mozambique's ability to be able to provide 
anything for its people. The idea of any uh, of health system, of social protection for the poorest people, left it unable to cope. And of course, we remember that Mozambique had to come here to the UK, to the city of London, to beg for more debt creating loans, to be able to have money, to be able to feed its own people. Those are the, of course, the existing inequalities. And I, I think we're in this profound moment. I mean, one of the things that, you know, that neoliberalism has always done, uh, I think for so many people, it's taken away our imagination. Um, so, you know, I, I think we're more, not, as you said, Suzanne, building back. Actually, we need to be dialing forward. And we need to be, as, uh, as Sharon said in, with our industry, thinking about the portal that we need to be going through. And at this moment is why we, together with LEAP and many of our partners and movements in the Global South, and in the global north have been working on this idea of what would a radical global green new deal look like and what should it do well our first starting point of course is it has to anchor some certain certain concrete pillars of course one of those is being keeping temperatures well below the 1.5 degree guardrail now we all know from the ipcc's report that what will happen if we breach that tipping point but the reality is of course that the existing carbon budget that exists to keep temperatures well below 1.5 actually is only about a decade uh, if we're actually talking about the real carbon budget we're not talking about loopholes and even then we've only got about a 50 50 chance of keeping temperatures so the profound challenge that we've got in terms of transforming our way transforming the world away from a fossil fuel based economy is profound and of course for a country like the uk its fair share would be about minus 200% by 2030. So not only would it need to decarbonize fully, it would need to be at the same time enabling transfers of both finance, intellectual property, and other things to the tune of at least a trillion to the global south, just to meet its fair share of its mitigation effort, let alone what the impact of adaptation or loss and damage or anything else that we're talking about. This is really profound. And of course, sometimes we get scared about these numbers. We have to remember the amount of trillions that were put forward when we went in to bail out the banks a decade ago during the austerity crisis. And this is our opportunity, I think, one to anchor the 1.5 and the fair shares. The second thing is to anchor also environmental limits. Often in the global north, people talk about the transformation and the transition of our economies without actually thinking about the material use or the resource limits that that puts on us. We already know that we use about 80 billion tons of, of material use each and every year. A sustainable amount in the, in the world is about 50 billion. It's predicted to be 167 billion tons within a decade. We're talking about 150% increase in material use. We're talking about a new wave of metal and mineral extraction of cobalt, lithium, iron ore, to be able to power the transition in the global north. And of course, that simply reproduces the logic of extractivism that can go not just to neoliberalism, but that has gone on for hundreds of years, which is to sacrifice the global south, both to environmental damage, to poverty and inequality, uh, for, for the benefit of the economies of the global north. So our answer isn't going to be simply found in electric batteries. Right? It's not simply about trying to shift a fossil fuel economy to a, a, an economy powered by renewable energy. We actually have to have a much more profound conversation. We have to have a profound conversation where our economy is for. You know, what do they serve? What is and then we have to have a profound conversation about energy. What is energy for? What is productive energy? How much energy uh, do people have? Because we're living in a world where half the world's population don't have access to electricity or clean cooking. So the idea of simply renewable energy for the global north while energy poverty exists for the global south, of course, is not a world that we want to be living in. At the same time, we have to be talking about acts around food and agriculture. We all know that, for example, the industrial agribusiness is responsible for about a third of all global emissions. But we live in a world where two billion people face issues of hunger, simply illustrated, of course, again, profoundly by the corona pandemic. 80% of those people, of the world's people, are currently fed by small farmers. And those small farmers are only use about 24% of land. It's 19% and even as low as 11% in places in Africa. What is the remainder of the land being used for? It's for, to, for commodities, the, for export to the global north, or for the industrial agribusiness. The idea that we can't feed the world, we can feed the world three times over. What we can't allow is an industrial agribusiness system which is simply about extracting even more resources from the, from the global south. And this is a world where already one third of all soil is being degraded. The, the estimates are by 2050, up to half of the, all the world's soil will be degraded, will no longer be productive. 
but to simply talk about the climate crisis, about energy and food, which I think we have to look back at the fight we had, you know, decades ago when we talked about food and energy and land and water as being the commons, owned by people, for the people, and shared equally amongst the people of the world. That actually has to be a central core, core of any analysis and thinking about the Global Green New Deal. As Sharon said, you know, we cannot, no Global Green New Deal that doesn't at its centre have the idea of tackling global inequality and the impact of neoliberalism is already doomed to fail. We all saw the banner from the Gilets Jaunes, the yellow vests in France, which said, you know, the elites worry about the end of the world, ordinary people worry about the end of the month. And of course, the corona pandemic has exposed that even more and more as low paid and people living from uh, ch ch uh, one month a week to week are exposed to the existing inequalities of the world. And as again, Sharon said, we live in a world 60% of all workers are already living in the informal economy, where half the world's population live on less than $5 a day, denied the basic fundamentals of a dignified life. So at the central core of our global Green New Deal has to be the idea of a universal basic income and guaranteed basic income. But that can, it cannot be a demand by itself. It has to be a demand that's linked to the social protection for all. We all understand now Social protection is, an, is, an, is the necessity and it's important for both formal workers and for the informal workers. We have to talk about how access to public services, health, education, housing are a fundamental right for all people. They are the cornerstones. And of course, no Green New Deal that doesn't have workers' rights, the right to organise, the right to unionise, can, can, can be a, a, a socially productive uh, 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 global Green New Deal. We have to... And one of the problems, I think, of current discussions around Green New Deal is often, of course, they're all talking about the nation state, and that's very, very important. But very few actually then talk about the global finance and architecture, the trade and investment, that is, the changes that are needed there. We talk about debt relief, and of course, 4.3 billion has flowed since in the last decades from the global south to the global north in unsustainable debt repayments. But also something like 18 billion is flowed in profits from the global south to the global north. Already, you know, uh, uh, one trillion pounds worth of mineral and metal wealth is owned by, uh, by 100 companies here in the city of London. More than the combined GDP of every country in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. That's the control we need to be, be shifting. So we need to also be talking about illicit tax flows. Something like 13 billion has flowed from the global south to the global north in tax havens, etc. So, of course, that has to also be a very, very important demand. And as part of that, um, of course, there is much we can talk about about what needs to happen in terms of our new trading systems. And, and very important for us here, of course, because at this moment, the UK is again driving free trade agreements, both with the US, uh, it wants to drive lowering of environmental standards, worker standards, opening up our, our public services to private competition, and wants to lower the or existing law uh, regulations that exist in the, in, the, in the world. And of course, John has done amazing work. And I have to say, you know, it, it's, a, it's a real hats off that, you know, we had a politician who understood that fixing the UK economy what couldn't be done at the expense of the global economy, that we had to be talking about how do we make our economy fairer and more sustainable, at the same time ensuring that Britain's legacy as both as a member of the G7, as the fifth richest country in the world, built on the back of exploitation and resources of people of the global south, was also acting in, uh, in accordance with, the, with people of the global south. So, you know, we, we also need to very much uh, think about also, I mean, think the corona pandemic has shown and exposed the issues around migration as well, as migrant workers have become particularly vulnerable. But there's a much bigger conversation, as we know, both from the climate impacts that are going to happen, which says that something like, you know, uh, uh, one in 20 people will likely be displaced from their homes forcibly in the coming decades. The majority of those people are displaced internally within the nation state. Nation states are already facing global inequality and are unable to be able to provide for their own citizens. Very, very few people, as we know, actually cross a national border or even a transnational border to the global north. So what we have to do is centre our global Green New Deal on the right of people not to move. And what is the most profound thing that people need for not to move? They need access to income. They need access to public services. They need the right to energy and food. 
we have to have a, I think, a really much bigger global conversation about what, how we answer the issues around migration. It's not simply about legal protection. Actually, it's about economic equality. I, I'm, I'm very conscious of, you gave me five minutes and I'm, I'm running. I, um, you know, Milton Friedman, you know, had said very famously, and I'm sure we all remember this quote, you know, crisis produces real change. And when crisis occurs, the actions that, de that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. And our basic function is to develop alternative existing policies. So until the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. And I think one of the challenges to all of us is that we have to be raising our imagination. So the, the very from both a just transition or a just recovery. I think we need to be thinking much bigger than that. I think we need to be talking about, you know, how do we move from uh, uh, not just relief, but recover and reimagine? How do we center the 1.5 tackling global inequalities in that? And I, I think there are three key pillars that we need to do. We need to, of course, put people first, not bail out the corporations. We need to guarantee people the right to energy and food, and we need to get, get, make sure we have a just recovery for economic justice. Now, I say that because the right are not sitting idly on their hands. In fact, the right are already, as we can see, we've seen the draconian and authoritarian response. We've seen it in Brazil. We've seen it in India. We're seeing how the far right is also exposed, ex exploiting the crisis around both corona and the crisis of inequality to drive xenophobia and racism and retreat with, with, behind the, walls, the mantra of walls and fences. We have been the true internationalists. Progressive peoples, politics have always been rooted in internationalism. And our global Green New Deal has to reproduce that and not simply talk about what's happening in the global north, but center the realities and experiences of the global south. I'll end there. Thank you. Yeah. OK, I was saying thank you um, and have myself on on mute. Um, I said thank you again for that. Um, our speakers were given five minutes and they've all relished um, an opportunity to speak for longer than five minutes, which were because they've had so many brilliant things to say. That, that's great. Um, I'm going to push ahead, though, and take the remainder of our speakers. I want to pose to our speakers, though, a couple of questions that keep coming up in the chat, uh, which I think are crucial. Um, there's a shared vision here of what needs to be done and the transformation that we need to make. Um, I think there's a shared sentiment that we're up against some serious forces who want to push that back. Uh, one of the questions that keeps coming up is the question of how do we bring about the change that we need? So how do we make what we're talking about here a reality in the weeks and months ahead? So I'd like speakers to think about that um, as I move to the to the next speaker and the next speaker is Sean Vanell. Um, Sean as I said earlier is a member of the UCU NEC. He's a, a teacher, a lecturer of uh, English GCSE at City and Islington College in uh, North London um, and he's on the he's on the further education, he's vice chair of the further education uh, committee of, of UCU. Um, he's author of an excellent pamphlet called Don't Get Young in the Third Millennium, Capitalism and the Demonization of the Young Working Class. And Sean also um, was one of the authors of the UCU's Charter for Real Jobs and Apprenticeships, um, which features the kind of climate work that young people should be um, uh, doing uh, and a vital part of our recovery. Um, and also Sean, and a big thank you again, Sean was one of the members of the UCU uh, who pushed to get that motion to the TUC conference last year, calling on trade unionists in the UK uh, to join the climate strikes and, and, and did allow for a, a major mobilisation of the trade union movement, uh, which we want to pick up and push further, obviously coming out of this crisis. Um, welcome to Sean. I'm going to ask Sean to unmute himself. Uh, one of the other questions that keeps coming up, up in the chat is this question of the mass unemployment um, that is about to hit us. And therefore, how do we respond to that with the agenda that we've spoken about at this moment in time? So I know Sean will, will, will speak to that. Uh, and please, if the other participants will be thinking about that question of youth unemployment and employment more, more broadly. And, and welcome, Sean. Off you go. Yes, uh, thank you. Brett. Can you hear me OK? Uh, perhaps a little bit louder. Um, OK, can you hear me now? Yeah. OK, so, um, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me and um, and 
really solidarity to the campaign uh, against climate change. I mean, uh, you see you're very proud to have affiliated to the organisation for many years and it does a brilliant campaigning work and long may it continue. So thank you for that. I, I mean, absolutely, I agree with all of the speakers so far, Sharon and, and Asim, thank you very much for your brilliant uh, overview there. Thank you, it's been really helpful and very clear and very inspiring actually about what, can, what could be done. And I also agree, I think that there are four interrelated crises here. There's one, which is the political crisis, there's a climate crisis, there's a public health crisis, and there's an economic crisis. All are clearly interlinked, and that's what we have to try and think about. It's quite clear that everybody seems to agree that um, we can't go back. We can't go back to pre-coronavirus world. The question is, what does the future hold? What kind of world do we want to end up in? And, you know, when, I, when you listen to you know, the likes of Donald Cummings and others, you know what they want. They do absolutely or clearly want to go back to a world where the market rules, where um, they continue to rake it in and make us pay for the economic crisis and the public health crisis, which, is, which has occurred in the last four or five months. That's absolutely clear. They want business as usual. But I think increasingly, millions of people around the world really don't see it like that. The experience, I think Sharon was saying, how do we take the best out of the what is happening to, the, to, to our world, where people are working together, are starting to see what possible world we need coming out of, uh, of the post coronavirus world. And, and that sort of sense of solidarity and collectivity is something we need to harness and bring forward into a world um, afterwards. But of course, as I think Suzanne and others are hinting at within the chat, well, this won't simply come about by wishing or having great ideas. It will be coming about by us fighting and organizing. I mean, if I have time, I'll just mention something about that. But what I really want to focus on is really education, because that's where I'm from. And, uh, and some of the questions I think that um, St is it Stefania and uh, Chris raised in the chat room about the question of, of, of apprenticeships and uh, employment and so on, because it's quite clear, isn't it, that the government and others have signaled that there's going to be one hell of an economic crisis if we don't stop them. And once again, just like in 2008, it'll be us despite everybody knowing it's the bankers' problems, the bankers' fault, and so on and so forth, it will be us, and particularly young working class people who will be, put, who will be made to pay for that crisis in, the, in, in, a few, in, in a number of months. Unemployment figures, you know, they're talking up to 1 million, or 600,000 to 1 million uh, young 16 to 24 year olds unemployed um, in the crisis. And I just want to say something about this first of all, about how things have not really changed. Really. If you go back to 19, part of the Second World War, the Second World War, right to the 1970s, we saw a situation whereby the majority of people in work, that is, were of the ages of 16 and 24. However, by the time you got to the early 80s, with the onslaught of the unfettered marketization, neoliberalism, Thatcher, Reagan, period, and so on, what you saw was an institutionalization of mass unemployment amongst young people in Britain. So now, the 16 to 24 year old age group they are they're less likely to be in, in employment at this uh, moment of, of time. You know, and every single government, Labour and, and Tory, and I have to say, it's a real shame, that other, like others, that John was not there. He's the best shadow chancellor we never had, uh, or the chancellor we never had. It was really, it's a real shame. I think it would be very different if, uh, if he and Jeremy had been, uh, been elected. But nevertheless, both Tory and Labour governments overrode some, never really got to, to grips with how to make sure that our young people did have jobs secure jobs, proper employment, and, and, and so on. And that is something which took place throughout the 19th, 1990s, as I say, complete democratisation of it. Um, yeah, the, the YTS schemes, some of us remember, the YOP schemes, and, and so on, all these we really ridiculous. And even today, the government's claim that the apprentice levy and the apprenticeship schemes are something in which will work, and uh, it is rubbish. They are, at best, they are, they're, they're, they're poor skills training jobs. I mean, the, the key thing, the starting point to make sure that we get jobs right here, or apprentices right, seems the precursor to that is, is their jobs. When you listen to the government over the years, it's, it's the argument is to say, well, the reason why these young people have no jobs, uh, or, or it's not because of the government policy of not intervening, investing in, in proper jobs and in, in securing employment, it's because teachers don't teach uh, properly, the courses aren't right, the parents don't discipline their kids hard enough, or whatever the ridiculous position that every other government put over the last numbers of years. I mean, if we smack them harder, then there'll be jobs or whatever. 
But it is quite clear the starting point when we talk about apprenticeships, we have to talk about it is the government problem. They have to create jobs. And when they create jobs, then we can talk about reskilling uh, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the working, working class within it. And here, I, I do think it's worth saying something about what kind of uh, jobs we're talking about here. I mean, I, I think it's important that what it used to use been campaigning for is, as I say, some of us will be at, the, at an age will remember. I don't want to have rose tinted glasses about the apprenticeships in the 1970s, but they were three years long. They were, they were educational a lot, lot of the time. They weren't simply skills training. So I think when we talk about a proper apprenticeship program, we need to talk about ones which not only are there jobs to go to, but also they are educational based. There's no forced separation between the vocational and the academic. They should be part and parcel of the same kind of, of effort. I mean, one of the things uh, we've tried to do uh, in UCU has it's created it's called a, a climate jobs. I mean, something again, the great manifesto pledges in, in the Labour Party's uh, manifesto was for, for create 500,000 climate jobs, well skilled, secure em employment. Uh, absolutely, and UCU very much supported that program and still do. We, we are campaigning for green skills as a, you know, as a major, major stumbling block to this, it's delivering a just transition to a zero carbon economy with integrated skills. Uh, uh, right across the board, effective embedding of education for sustainable development across the curric curriculum. And I think that you know, one of the things we've, we've tried to do more recently in, in UCU was, uh, at my college, in fact, John came along and, um, and launched it, was a themed uh, learning week around the whole question of climate, climate change. And it was a great week. I mean, hopefully you might you can get a link. I'll put it up there and you can have a look at it yourselves without me going into it. But it's, we really crossed the whole week. We transformed the, uh, the college to focus in around climate change and integrate into maths, into history, into English, into, into business studies and, and so on and so forth. So when we talk about education, we have to talk about it. You know, it's a separate thing, the question of climate change. It must be an integral part of everything we teach. And, and again, the, one of the great things about the growing across, if it is a great thing, is we, we, our young people aren't doing exams. We have to rethink about how we don't have an education system which is simply geared towards examination after examination after examination, and instead we're focusing upon a much more project-based, assessed, a teacher-assessed-led uh, kind of curriculum. That is something we'll be looking at again. So our theme learning weeks are part and parcel of trying to do that, and climate must be uh, also part of those kinds of, uh, kinds of things. I mean, I think the idea of, of how we go about it, I mean, our, we were very proud indeed in UCO to not only take the TUC motion and get the, the, the stoppage we got and so on, 120 universities and colleges down tools in the day and came out in solidarity with those school students when they took those, those brilliant climate strikes, strikes back in the, on September the 20th and every Friday since. And we need to do more of the same. I mean, June the 1st, there is a call by the NEU and other unions for a solidarity day of action with those union workers, those workers who have been forced back to, their, to, to, to education. We must not allow this to happen. Um, and that kind of solidarity we in the here and now to ensure that we, we have safe workplaces. We, raise, we can also raise demands about the kinds of world in which we want to live in the way in which Acid and Sharon, and no doubt John, and what John has done in, in, in the past. So I do think the sort of solidarity work, the action, because I... I think the ideas we have are brilliant. They are winning ideas. I think they have an audience of millions. People seem to make sense. We want a planned economy, not a marketized one. Competition has got us in this mess and we don't need it anymore. However, if we are going to be able to sustain that and bring that about, then it's going to be by not just our power of our arguments, our eloquence, but also through our action, our activity, our solidarity. And that is, I think, something in which uh, is very difficult at the moment because we are sitting behind computers and so on. But as somebody mentioned in the uh, chat, actually the government are vulnerable. You know, uh, they have had to, uh, Boris Johnson had had to retreat this week over a number of things, the migration laws and so on. And I'm convinced if we continue to campaign in the way we do, we are with uh, the common sense, if you like, at this moment of time, we can actually start to not only push this government back, make sure they do protect and defend uh, working people, but also not allow no return to a period of history where once again all working class people, but especially young working class people, are made to of are, are, are the scapegoats and the ones who have to pay through their jobs, their livelihoods, that lost generation, if you like. Um, never again can we have that again. We've had too many lost generations in the last two decades or more, and it doesn't need to be so. It's a political choice. It's a conscious choice. And one in which we can have be very different if we campaign in the way we are. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Sean. Thank you. That that's fantastic. Um, I thanks for addressing that question as well. I'm I'm going to I'm going to move on and take our, our last speaker. Um, we still we have over 220 participants. Um, we have a, a wee problem with a few people who were wanting to access um, today's webinar and have found that their uh, emails have gone to their junk boxes so they weren't able to access us um, on time so hopefully those people will be joining just in time to hear John which is always a very very good thing um, but we will be recording this we are recording this webinar and we will share um, and so hopefully people who weren't able to access when they wanted to will get an idea um, of what we were talking about um, about today I, I think with no further ado let me let me move to John and um, to finish off and then we will take some questions but I do just want to say before I, I, I hand over to John um, many people have said it already about what a uh, different situation we would have been in um, if John had been in number 11 and Jeremy had been in number 10 but I think in terms of handling this crisis most definitely uh, we wouldn't have had this rush to prioritize profit over people and the huge number of deaths that we have seen in in the uk um, and we would have been beginning uh, we would i feel have been beginning to talk about this transition that we need to, to to happen but in a real way actually starting to map it out what it would look like the money that would be available the climate jobs that we've created the investment that would take place um, so there you go but i want to also just congratulate john on on, on something else that John has a long history in terms of climate and environmental campaigning and I'm not sure how many people realize quite how long John's commitment to these issues has has been uh, very much so so I, I, I want to just sing John's praises for that as well um, loads more I could say but I, I think that's probably sufficient so John thank you not just for what you have done in the last couple of years but also for your long long history uh, of campaigning uh, uh, and thinking strategically about how we can de deliver the change needed um, to tackle this climate environmental crisis john i'm going to hand over to you welcome <laughs> uh, thanks suzanne it's, it's beginning to sound like a memorial meeting if you don't mind me saying so um i'll start i'll, st I'll start with it's interesting you mentioned about uh, i'll start with a couple of anecdotes can i because you mentioned about the long-standing campaign. It shows you how much the world has changed. I don't know if some of you can remember. I think it must be about 15 years ago. I can't remember. I might have got it wrong. But um, Jeremy, myself, um, Caroline Lucas, and I was funded by PCS. We set off a, a tour of a tour of the country with a on the Green New Deal, a million jobs booklet. Can you remember that? It was quite a while back. And we, we had a thing turn around. I think it was a caravan, if I remember rightly. Yes. And it was, it was, we sent it all around the country. And I don't think we had a meeting larger than about 30 people. And it was really difficult getting interest. Can you remember? It was really yeah. a struggle getting an interest, pushing it along and all the rest of it. But we did get some coverage, but it was tough. It was really tough. However, you know, God, how much it's moved on. It's just incredible, really. I, how alert people are to the issue now and it was a bit <laughs> it was about sh shouting in the mists at one point in time and the work that people like Caroline and Jeremy and others have done much more than me has been absolutely terrific. The other anecdote is that um, people talk about it would have been great if I'd have been the Chancellor and all this sort of thing well I went through a number of chance Tory chancellors and each one of them I I try, as you may know, I tried to give a book to, and in fact, I chucked a couple of them across the table in, uh, in the Commons. One was a, a small red book, and then the second one was when Philip Hammond went, I sent across a larger red book, which was a tourist guide to London, but it was the tourist guide to radical London, walks all around London where you could demonstrate where demonstrations took place, disputes where Marx used to go and get drunk every now and again, that sort of thing. I, before I left, um, Sadri Javed was the chancellor in situ and I'd announced I was standing down. I was going to give him a book someone had given me to give him, which was Mark Linus's Six Degrees. And it was about trying to educate them a bit. And exactly as Assad said, it's about those consequences of what would happen with global warming degree by degree. And it was a really good book. It's a bit old, but it was a really good book for its time. 
The only problem was, by the time I got the book ready to give him, Savage Javid had resigned already. That was the problem. Anyway, I'll send it to I'll send it to Rishi Sunak. Anyway, you never know. And look, two things. I think we've got to approach this with a, with absolute optimism now. And I, this isn't unrealistic optimism. This is the reality of what we're now facing. I think the, I think the whole tenure of debate around what's potential, the point you made, Suzanne, the tenure about what's potential in our world now has changed dramatically uh, with the way in which tragically the pandemic has hit us. And the lessons coming out of the pandemic, which we've got to drive home, is basically one, that feeling of solidarity that we can only get, you know, this concept that the Tories used to use about austerity, we're all in it together. Well, in the pandemic, we are all in it together. And, and tragically, some are more in it than others, particularly the Bain community in terms of the system. But actually, it has brought about an element of a concept of solidarity again within our society, about how we've got to work together. That's the first thing. The second thing, I think it has challenged people's values about what they value in the world now. I think people are increasingly thinking, well, actually, everything we've been taught to value around individual and individual wealth and greed, et cetera, there's more important things than that. And part of that is human relationships, but actually also, I think, actually, part of that is about the environment too. The number of people who said to me about, I live in London, the number of people who say to me at the moment, they can hear the birds for the first time in their gardens or in their parks, or they can breathe fresh air. My constituencies, uh, uh, Sean and Assad and, and Suzanne, you'll know, I've got Heathrow in my constituency. The airplanes are not flying. We've got no noise, hardly, and also people have no longer breathing the air pollution, poisonous air that's coming out of the airport. And it's quite remarkable. So I think people have discovered what more they value, not just about human relationships, but also the environment itself. The other lesson that's coming out of this pandemic crisis is, as actually you said, Suzanne, all of a sudden people realize there's no shortage of resources. If we need money, we can create it. If we can, if we can uh, need investment, we can, yes, use the low rates of interest that there are to borrow for the long term and invest. And you know, even, <laughs> even some of the right now are having to accept there has to be some redistribution as well within our society if we're going to get through all this. So I, I think that's another lesson that's been learned. There's no shortage of resources when we want to tackle a crisis, full stop. This, I suppose the next element of, of, I think that's quite important that's come out of the pandemic, which is going to help us, is the recognition of the role of the state. And actually, it is about the collective. It isn't about individualism. It's about how we all come together as a community and how we ensure that we use the mechanisms and tools that are available to us, one of which is the national, global and local state. And I think that's quite a breakthrough from what we've seen before, which is 10 years of privatisation, individualism, which has resulted in a downgrading of the state. In fact, this whole argument the Tories put forward and others have put forward about the small state, I think that's gone as well. And the other issue that's come out of the pandemic is that when you're faced with a crisis, it's that sense of urgency. Now, I think those lessons we've got to build upon for this next crisis. And I've been saying every speech I do around the pandemic crisis, I always I, so I repeat most of which you've all said, which is, you know, the big one is coming at us fast. And the big one isn't just the pandemic. The big one is the existential threat to our planet and our whole existence. And I actually do think people, having learnt the lessons of this pandemic, there's an opportunity to wake them up to the big crisis that, that we now face. Um, but I, there's an, I want to let, address some of the questions that have been, been posed in a way which says, what are the lessons that we, from the pandemic into dealing with this next crisis? And how can we go forward? Because most of the questions that are coming in are actually, how can we move, move this forward? Uh, six points, really. Um, one is absolute clarity of our objectives now. And um, the, the messaging I think we've got to be absolutely clear of, and Assad and, uh, has been working on this for quite a while you now. I think, I, think I think we are near to people understanding the, the 
clarity of the objectives for this next 20 year, 30 year period. 20 years really, you know. OECD countries, 80% cut in emissions by 2030. I think we can drill that into people now and what that means. In terms of zero carbon by 2040, I think people can be alerted to that now. So I think the first point now for us in this next round of discussions is saying to people, look, we've dealt, we're dealing with this pandemic. And as, as, as Sharon has said, that we might have a second or third way, but we're dealing with it. But we've got this bigger one, and we, here's the objective we've got to meet. 80% cut by 2030, zero carbon by 24, all OECD countries. I agree with Assad. I think our country, because of its colonial history and its history as a result of the developing the first industrial revolution, certainly has a greater role to play. The, the second point is um, Anne Pettifer's point in the Green New Deal book, which is, and it's been coming up time and time again in, 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 in the comments, you can't, you can't separate the ecological threat from the threat of our finance system and the way we organize our economy. So therefore, it does open up that whole wider debate. Sharon's re uh, referred to it in some of the global institutional issues that we have to deal with. But also, Assad and Sharon have both raised the levels of poverty, the degradation, the exploitation that goes on. And that's all as a result of, yes, our overall how we manage our economic system. So you have to raise questions about that. But actually, we have a special role to play in the UK. Assad used the example of Mozambique. One of the best examples there is, I met with the women from Boz Mozambique, can you remember Assad, before we did our international social conference. Um, what happened to them is that they're hit with climate change floods. They go to their state to find the resources to tackle that issue. They discover secretly their government has made a deal in the city of London, for borrowing large amounts of money where that money then disappears. And as a result of that, they haven't got the resources to tackle climate change issues as they confront them. Yeah, you can blame the Mozambique government, you can blame corrupt governments across the world and all the rest of it, but actually the money laundering effectively, because that's what it was, occurred where? It occurred, well, six miles, seven miles down from where I am now in the city of London. So it exposes the whole link, linkages between ecological devastation, the operation of our economic system under capitalism, and also exposes the specific role that the UK plays in the world, particularly the city of London. And again, you've, you've all mentioned the issues around tax avoidance and tax evasion. The city of London is the biggest tax haven funnel that there is in the world. We know that, and it is a lot of it dirty money too. So I think opening up that debate and the linkage between the ecological disaster and the financial and economic system that we have is absolutely critical to us. And I think people are open for that now. The third issue has come up in the um, chat. Um, it's how we do we measure the effectiveness of uh, our policies, both in terms of ecological, of course, and we can, we can go into much more detail in the questions on that, but also how do we look at the effectiveness of our economic policies linked to the ecological challenges as well. And we've got to confront GDP as a measure. We've got to confront this issue of growth. And the, some of you may remember we raised this last year and I keep kept quoting Robert Kennedy's speech, uh, which I thought was absolutely beautiful. Where he said, how GDP does not measure the value of my child's poetry. And we're at that stage within our society at the moment where we we the economic assessments that are made, both in terms of government, in terms of common debate and also within the media, around this issue of gross domestic product in particular, are completely unrelated to the real world as we experience them and the challenges that we face. Someone mentioned um, Kate Rowers. We, Kate Rowers appeared on our platforms we, a number of times. We did an annual State of the Economy conference and she was at one of the earliest ones. Um, and we were trying to say then that we've got to now look at different measures. And those different measures are, yeah, her well-being overall, the way New, New Zealand has, but much broader, I think. And the issues around um, how we can make sure people can sustain themselves and have the resilience themselves financially and socially. But also we've got to build into that, therefore, the future survival of our race, which has got to be how we tackle our, well, the usual, all the things, you know, the soils, the aquifers, um, the, the, all the 
pollution aspects of our society that we have now and even down to that discussion about pollination that we had a couple of years ago which I actually did catch the public imagination when we were talking about things like the survival of bees and that opens up therefore I think a much wider debate about the nature of the society that we have. The fourth point then is the, the, the policies themselves. I mentioned Kate Rowell, actually just proved this point, I've got the the book here I think is worth people reading it because it's a, a circular economy discussion we've got to get into. The, the fourth point I make is about the nature of the policy. Sean's touched on this. People are asking what, how can we tackle these issues about unemployment that's going to face us, particularly about young people etc. Uh, where, well, where we are at the moment, let's be clear, um, the government has introduced a series of support policies that were advocated by us, in fact we submitted to them um, in advance of any decisions by, by government. They didn't um, introduce exactly what we wanted, but they went some way towards it. This issue of furloughing, supporting wages, etc. The problem with it, there was huge exclusions. The furloughing wasn't 100% wages support either. They didn't increase sick pay or benefits as we, we wanted them to. And they didn't introduce a basic minimum income guarantee, which, which we were arguing for. However, what they have introduced um, has meant that actually some jobs have been preserved, others haven't. But when it comes to the 1st of August uh, and they withdraw the support, uh, the threshold of 80% and withdraw that support and expect companies to then to start paying maybe 25%, even up to 40% of wages, that's when we see the big wave of redundancies. And I think that's why we've got to then offer the, the alternative which is available to us to recognize and we've got a crisis on our hands in terms of, in terms of climate change and, and the impact of that. We have the potential of a Green New Deal, which will produce the jobs and the skills that we need to tackle that. And we can go through you know, that transfer of those skills into the new work jobs that we need, right the way across the piece, whether it's home insulation, whether it's the development of battery factories that we wanted to develop the, the electric cars that we wanted or the electric vehicles or whether it's the alternative energy sources. All of those are available to us, and we now know that there's no shortage of resources from government to enable that to happen. And I think, again, the concept of the Green New Deal, or what, what do you call it, the Green Industrial Revolution, all of those policies that we were advocating the last two Labour manifestos, and many of the unions worked with us to develop them in detail, they should be the platform from which we start arguing that there is an alternative to people being laid off. Someone mentioned in the chat about transport, and of course the big issue for us is the investment in transport that we need, both in terms of buses, but we need to make sure they're environmentally um, sound and, and uh, electric, etc., and alternative energy sources. But in addition to that, someone raised the issue of aviation. Well, at the moment, in my constituency, British Airways have just announced 12,000 job losses, and what they're doing is is they're laying people off. But that's that even with the potential of aviation picking up again within 12 months, that's not so much about aviation being reduced in the future. They're, they're simply doing that to cut wages and conditions for those workers themselves. And what the Unite and other unions are doing now, and looking at how we develop an environmental aviation policy, uh, which will provide jobs in the future, but for where those workers are displaced and there won't be jobs for them as aviation is reduced overall, almost inevitably, um, that there are alternative jobs provided in terms of developing the just transition to an environmentally friendly economy. It's as simple as that and it's all doable. Last couple of points really is if we have the policies, we need the institutional framework both national and globally to you know, make sure these policies are implemented. And um, Sharon's touched upon this. Um, we do have to challenge the WTO. We have to challenge these organizations that are taking place. And if you look at what's happening um, on the existing trade deals, the investor dispute mechanisms, which are already being used against countries that are ending privatization or investing in public services rather than opening up their public privatization and competition. And you'll see how those investor dispute mechanisms will work against us if we don't challenge them now. And I think there's the potential there for looking at new global institutions that will enable us to work and cooperate together but also that will overcome the inheritance of these trade deals that already exist and prevent the trade deals that Trump and others, including Boris Johnson, 
want to impose upon us. But I think one of the key elements of any global institution has got to be the point that Assad has made, which is in, in terms of the resources, the knowledge, the technology, it has to be transferred on the basis of not being a commodity from the developed to the global south. Um, and from our country, uh, we should call it what it should be called, which are reparations, and make sure that people are aware that that's what this, this role that we have to play for the future. Finally, the point is that people are asking, well, how do we go, how do we achieve this? Um, well, we have to build the biggest social movement that the world has seen. It's as simple as that. And we build it upon the existing institutions that we know work, the trade unions, the other campaigning organizations that we have, but we build a, a social movement network on a scale that can not just transform policies at the local and, and national level, but at the global level too. But I, I do repeat, you know, one of the things that we learned a few years ago, you know, Schumacher and others was about, you know, small is beautiful. You do start at the local level, you build upon local foundations that you can then build the, the enthusiasm, the ideas and the creativity and the implementation mechanism that can change the world. And I, I, I agree with what every panelist has said, basically. Um, I, I support the um, campaign that's been um, launched around um, Build Back Better. I just don't like the back. Um, I don't want to go back. I don't, I don't want to go back to the old normal. I don't want to reclaim anything. I want to build something completely new, a new society. And that new society will have at its heart well, our ecological survival. Thanks, Suzanne. Yeah, thank you, John. Thank you. Um, I, 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 I think I'm going to do the following because we are now um, running out of time. Um, and I think the fact that we are running out of time uh, says how, how important this discussion, these discussions are. So I'm going to flag up for all of our speakers now that I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to bring each of you back to say some final, see it as some final words, um, because I don't think we'll have time to come back to you again. And please, I'd be incredibly grateful if you could uh, check the words doc that was sent to you so that any specific questions to you, as well as any final comments that you want to make uh, would be very, very useful. Um, I'll round up at the very end, but I just, give our speakers a couple of minutes to think. I want to just say this. Uh, John mentioned at the beginning um, he, uh, the, the climate jobs caravan um, that we ran a, a, very, a good few, few years ago where we essentially took the message of climate jobs up and down the country. Um, he may be right that we never had an audience bigger than 30. Uh, maybe we pushed it to 40 or 50 in some, in some cities, but laid a basis for some really, really important um, uh, winning of, of debates and discussions within the trade union movement that jobs and the environment were not mutually exclusive. I say that not to um, rewrite the history uh, of, of that particular moment, valuable though I think it was, but to say this, actually what I think, one of the things I do think we need to start doing now, and it links to a lot of the questions that were raised in the chat, is we do need to start those local conversations now. We need to bring into the room the climate justice activists, the trade unionists, the, you know, the local community, to actually look, there should be no job losses in any community at this moment in time. It's not like there isn't work that needs to be done. So what would that just front transformation look like within the local community? Someone mentioned Rolls-Royce up there. I mean, and I, I, it made me think about Vestas. I don't know if people remember Vestas a, few, a good few years about where, where the workers occupied the factory uh, to say that we shouldn't be stopping to make wind turbines in that factory. You know, these are the kind of acts of resistance solidarity um, and rebellion that we need at this, 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 this moment in time. Um, I want to bring people back in um, uh, to do that final round up um, and then a few final words to finish up uh, today's webinar. Um, so I think perhaps if we do it in, in, in this order, um, if I could bring in Sharon and then Sean and then Asad and John if you want to make any final comments at the end please feel free to do that. So Sharon, is that enough time for you to? Off you go. Great. Thanks, Sharon. So 
we don't have time to cover what was a very rich set of questions and discussions in the chat and I apologize for that and I express my gratitude for the great contributions of the panelists but I wanted to address three things that clearly were directed more towards me one is of course what is the new social contract if you go back to the uh, disasters of two world wars and a great depression we built our global institutions and they looked very different in the sense of ambition i can tell you coming out of those disasters where people said we have to have national and global flaws of rights so the ilo was born one of the initial institutions on a tripartite basis because it was about work and employment security and hope we then built the Bretton Woods institutions with a very, very different set of ambitions to the ones that are being executed today. We also were, and we need financial institutions, as John said, they just need to be different. And, uh, and of course, the WTO today, I'm absolutely scathing about, you know, how we haven't had the flexibility to deal with a trade environment that was balanced and fair we need global trade, but we also need to have a much more development-oriented approach. And uh, and John covered all those, as Assad did, all the illicit flows and so on that have just gone on as if they're somehow separate. In fact, the worst conversations you can have with WTO leaders is, well, inequality is not a problem of trade. It's actually a problem of government. Hello, yes, but what about the power of corporations saying, I will withdraw my FDR, you know the story. So this is ridiculous. It's just denial at its worst and it's evil, frankly. But the Havana Charter, if you go back to the Charter of Havana, on which the WTO was in fact meant to be based, much different. I've just written about this, so I won't go on, but I actually think we can rebuild a system of international institutions if, as John said, there's enough of us demanding it and governments feel the heat. That, so the new social contract then became the basis of full employment. We don't hear that word much more, although it's on the mandate of many central banks, including I think your own. And, uh, and of course it was about rights, it was about shared distribution of wealth, about income share. Now in the eighties with, it was already cracks in it, but in the eighties with hyper-globalization, you actually saw exploitation, low wages, uh, you know, pressing down the contract price, all of the things that we know, an explosion of uh, trade liberalisation without any real care about the things John's talking about, technological sharing, and as Saad mentioned, and other things, despite our so-called quest for development. We have hope with the SDGs and the Paris Climate Agreement. The leaders in 2015, for whatever reason, saw a capacity to converge on a roadmap that would give us zero poverty, zero carbon, if we were serious enough to pursue it, and we must. The, so the new social contract is about, in fact, building back a floor of rights, about income share, about uh, um, hours of work. And yes, we're gonna face whoever wrote about the four day working week, absolutely. It might be four days, it might be reduced working time, my unions will get, really upset if I prescribe an orthodoxy around these things, who cares? We have to share work. If we want our children to have work, if we want equal employment for women, if we wanna do something about mental health, let's reduce the stress on the workforce, but let's not use it as an excuse to cut wages. Let's look at what that living wage is. And I would just say on the universal basic income, yes, yes, and yes, but as part of a broader social protection, I don't need a universal basic income. That's ridiculous. So it's not for those of you not in work. It's actually got to be the floor on which dignified societies share our wealth. And that's why we fight so hard for social protection and for a global solidarity. And finally, I would just say, on the question of industries and jobs, we can do a lot better. We can have an, a, a, a more sustainable aviation industry. I understand why people don't want planes flying. You know, the sky's blue in Brussels now. I've never realized that could be the case. But, uh, and I come from Australia, so I miss the big blue skies. But you can have tomorrow aviation with a third less uh, uh, fuel production. Yeah, sorry, a, a third less uh, emissions 
um, if you actually change the fossil fuel mix. You can have a third if you actually use retrofit and, and, and uh, efficiency, basically, lighter parts, which are possible with 3D printing and so on. And of course, there are jobs in retrofit. And then nature-based solutions. There's a lot of discussions about ecological sustainability. And as an ambassador for the Food and Land Use Coalition, absolutely food security and the distribution of wealth from food is absolutely critical and the waste. So I'm a great fan of circular economies. And I finished by saying this, industry transition, absolutely. You know, emissions reductions, absolutely. But with the jobs and the income, that make it possible for a new social contract. And I can tell you, we should focus on our cities. It's not to ignore the hinterlands, but if you look at the demand and supply chains in and out of cities, and we got that right, and they were living cities with the demand into our communities for manufacturing, for services, et cetera, we would in fact be creating a much different economy that gets us towards that circular economy. And finally, John, beyond GDP, Absolutely. That's what our rebuilding trust in democracy is all about. I won't go on, but I saw here about uh, in uh, deliberative budgeting, consultation, you know, being transparent about the things people care about, living standards, jobs, social protection, environment, all of those things. And I love the wellbeing movement. It's a bit soft. I love Jacinda Ardern. She's one of my great, uh, you know, colleagues and friends from my part of the world. But but we need to be tough. It's about government accountability. Why do we elect politicians if they're not going to actually build societies that are in the interests of people? So a lot we could talk about, Suzanne, but a great conversation with the panellists. And I look forward to uh, offline uh, pursuit of some of these issues. But people power is where it's at. Thank you, Sharon. That's a great place to finish. Um, I asked for Sean. Um, Sean, yeah, okay. can I ask oh, perhaps a little bit more brevity? Uh, yeah. It's all doable. Um, so, Sean, off you go. Yeah, uh, just three points. Um, firstly, I think, uh, yeah, I've really enjoyed the, the, the discussion. And thank you for all the, the, the questions in the, in the panel, the chat. I mean, I do these things on occasion. And it's very difficult to try and do this and read every single thing there, but clearly, it's a very democratic way of working. So you're in and out of the conversations and listening to other people's ideas and thoughts and opinions. Really, really useful. So thank you for all those and apologies. But I, I certainly can't be able to uh, do them all um, uh, at all. But I think someone's about jobs and, and where we go from here, how, we, how can we get to a situation like a better world? What are mechanisms for doing so? Or ones which um, I think we continue need to, to address. I, I think John and others are right. You know, one of the things that's quite clear, they can't tell us the money's not there anymore. You know, they told us year in, year out, come on, we'd like to do this. We need austerity because the money's not there. You've got to be budgeting properly. All these arguments you heard in my own workplace, we've lost 25,000, not my own, work, my own sector, in the further education sector. We've lost 25,000 jobs in the last eight years. You know, we've lost a 27% cut in our wages. Uh, One million um, adult education places have gone. I mean, this is an, uh, taking place in adult education is an is a educational historic scandal what has taken place over the last number of years. That's what we've been fed. And there's no need for this. It is a, it's a political choice governments make. And yes, we want intervention and they have intervened. And that is something we can draw from this. Governments can intervene to save their system. But that's the point, isn't it? They're not doing it so that they can help the rest of us. They're doing it because they want to help their system and save it. And that's something we've got to say, well, no, you've shown that the money is there. You've shown that intervention can work, but we want intervention that is based upon helping everybody and not just a tiny minority of profits so they can reserve. Them. So I think that's an important point we could build upon and start to build up strategies around it. The question of jobs, the question of young people and so on, well, the, 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 the launch, the, the tax are taking place in the here and now. I mean, in Liverpool University, 600 jobs uh, have been threatened. Redundancies have just come up. In Roehampton University, uh, 150 jobs. At Croydon, 30 jobs. This is a scandal in any situation. In the present context, it's an absolute scandal that these employers are lining up to take people's jobs away from education, any jobs, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the industries which have already been mentioned, but also, of course, in the universities. But that tells you where we're going with these people. This is exactly what they want, how they see their priorities are, 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 are for the future. They want the same old world where they can sack university lecturers, they can sack 
uh, young, pe young people in the, in the, uh, un unemployed, create another lost generation, and none of them will ever, ever have a, wash their hands of every single part of it. And that's what we've got to try and stop. And that's why I say this, really. I think, what can we do in here and now? Because the, the future battle is always related to the battle in the here and now. It's very difficult when we're in these, this situation. When we look around and think, well, is there, are, are we having an impact as activists? Are we having an influence over the world in which we have on government? Well, because you can't see the demonstrations. You can't see the strikes. You can't see the mass movements as such. But let's be clear, it's taking place and they're having an influence. There are big movements and the fact that 20,000 people turned up to an NEU a Zoom meeting, 17,000 people joined a trade union in my own, in the NEU in the last few, in the last few weeks. The only union, something like six or 7,000 joined in the last two months. Trade unions are back in fashion and the employers know it and the Daily Mail know it. They're the ones, who's, who they're attacking? They're attacking the trade unions because they know it is about class. They know who are the barriers to making sure that their vision of the, of the post-coronavirus world is not one in which uh, they hope to, to, to pursue. And that's why I think what we do now is important. And our last plug will go with this. On the June the 1st, there's a battle taking place around June the 1st. The government are trying to force our young people, our school students, our school teachers back to work in unsafe conditions. The five tests that the NEU, the UCU and many other unions support is something which we all need to get behind. Because if, we, if they're not successful, then that not only here and now, are they forcing back people into unsafe workplaces? But it means they're more confident to continue to shape the battles and uh, line up for their, their version of the reconstruction of a post-coronavirus world. And therefore, I think it's important that we get behind us. Therefore, there's a call being set out to make sure every workplace has Zoom meetings, organisers, do something on the face to show your solidarity with the, with the, the school unions uh, to say, we're with you 100%. You should not be forced back into unsafe workplaces. And I think that part of the argument is not separate from the argument about climate change, about the political crisis or the economic ones. The fight in the here and now can shape the future. End. It's muted, Suzanne. You're muted, Suzanne. I said, I said, thank you, Sean. That was absolutely brilliant. And I'm going to hand over to Assad. A few final comments, Assad, please. Okay. So, so three key points. Um, I think the challenge in, on all of these webinars, and you always get this question, like, you know, well, we're great at analysing what the problem, how do we move forward? And I would say, look, you know, no, no transformative change has ever happened without a vision. You have to be able to describe the world we want so that people can see themselves in it. People aren't going to want something, no matter how much we think it will be better, if you can't construct it and people can see themselves in it, right? And that's been obviously one of the huge problems of the climate movement for decades. It talked about a world by using imagery of polar bears. It took out people. It talked about less for everybody. It didn't actually portray and, and, and was able to describe the world we want. So we have to have a vision. That's central. We have to have transformative political demands. And whilst it's true that there are thousands of demands that we have, and there are thousands of decisions of neoliberalism that we'd like to undo, the key question is, what are the most important politically transformative demands that if we all fought for and if we won, would, would have a benefit for all of our movements and would be transformative? And we know that in the UK, many of us have argued that means free public transport, public warm homes and decent housing. At a global level, it means about, you know, workers' rights and, and, uh, and universal public services. We have to be able to construct those bold ideas because the right does do that. The right frame is actually quite easy to understand. It is able to articulate the vision that it wants. It's not our world, but it is compelling. And that's why the right all around the world are much more pop popular because they understand what populism means. And that shouldn't be a, a, a word that the left should shy away from. What are our populist demands? Now, you know, it's up in the alter globalization movement in the 90s, we used to say one no, many yeses. And that is problem, problematic because we, yes, we know that there are different yeses at a local level and a national level at a global level, but we have too many yeses, right? Uh, we have to be able to uh, get down to this is what we want. The third part of that, of course, is how do we build power? How do we, there is no point in us having vision or demands if the third pillar of what we do is not movement building. 
and we have to rebuild solidarity. We have to rebuild the principles of internationalism. And of course, as John and everybody recognize, you can't do that without the trade union movement. The most powerful institutions on our side are the trade union movement. And for too long, the environment conversation has always seen workers as being secondary and rather than as being central. And so, yes, it's great that we finally got to a conversation about a just transition, right? After decades of fighting that the environment movement needs to put workers' rights and workers uh, at the center. But now we have to make sure that we go from not just talking about just transition, but actually to be talking about not just transitioning those workers who are in employment, but the reality for the millions of people who are in low pay or without work as well. And that's why I liked the title. It's one, of course, a decade ago in the response to the austerity crisis, jobs, justice, climate, we tried to bring forward three and say, this is how we build the movement against austerity. We have to learn the lessons of how we lost in that fight against austerity, right? And, we, and, and the response was the banking, the bankers and the elites became more powerful and we and ordinary people paid the price of a decade of austerity. That's why it's part of the Global Green New Deal project. We are bringing movements and trade unions and, and thought leaders uh, together to actually have a global conversation, not just what's here are your top 10 things we must do, but how do you actually build from the bottom upwards as well to be able to construct these demands? And I put it in the chat, do go on and have a look www.globegnd.org. Um, we were going to have this incredible event, which John was also going to be a part of, which was a closed door policy event that was going to bring a hundred of the leader movements and trade unions to have this conversation. Unfortunately, Corona, has, uh, the lockdown prevented that. We moved now to sort of digital. I think the second point I just want to talk about the in terms of economic growth. Now, often there is a huge conversation, and of course, we in the environment movement now people are saying, you know, what about GDP? What about economic growth? And of course, when we start from a point of 14.3 million people in the UK are living in poverty, that's 22% of our population. And of course, that's going to get much, much worse as part of the, of the impact of what the corona recession. And we're in a world where one in five UK companies don't pay a penny in taxes, right? Where, as John said, the UK city of London facilitates one third of all the tax havens in the world. That's, that's incredible. And of course, the impending impact for the global south is even more uh, uh, horrific. You know, the idea that a, a half of all workers in the global south will be left destitute without work, I think is, is a really central one. So I, I'm often asked this question and people always say, but I, when we say to people, you have to have less, I want to stop us talking about less. I want us to talk about better, right? How do we move to a better economy? How do we start, not from, and I agree with Sharon, I, I like well-being for lots of woolly reasons, but actually I want to say, what guarantees people the right to a dignified life? How do we guarantee that? And how do we make our economy work for that? So again, we move less from the, and we have to decouple to GDP, move away from well-being to, to, to doing that. And of course, that's, there's lots of parts of that, reducing working hours and all sorts of, of different things. But, you know, the reality is that the top 1%, the top 1% last year captured $19 trillion worth of wealth. That's more than the entire GDP of the poorest 169 countries in the world together. That's how much wealth there is. There is never a question that there's not enough wealth. The question is who has the power and who controls that wealth. And that for me is about then the third most important thing, which is about how do we rebuild internationalism? And it does mean political education as well. Look, you know, we, many of us, we talk about the importance of solidarity and people say, well, you know, in a time of crisis, it's really hard to talk about solidarity, even beyond your borders. And, we, and you know, we all cite, we talk about the Rochdale famine in 1863 when, you know, uh, unemployed, destitute cotton uh, workers, uh, uh, cotton mill workers refused to handle cotton from slave producing states in, in the global south, even though they were destitute because they said their solidarity was with those people. We talk about the Lucas plan, which talked about how you could transform, you know, the armament industry to produce in 1976 to talk about building wind turbines and kidney dialysis machines. We know we have the ability to be able to do that, but we have to also recognize you know, last year they did an opinion poll and 43% of the British public think the empire was a good thing, right? I mean, that's, that's the scale of challenge that we, we face. And, you know, there are moments we have to look back 
you know, we have to think about how did we build that anti-imperialism of the 1970s and 80s? How did we rebuild build the idea of people standing in solidarity with struggles, whether we're in Chile or in across the continent of Africa and in, in Asia, etc. And there are incredible examples that are happening now. We saw the response in Chile, the cradle of neoliberalism, of the huge movements that were out on the streets that brought together the trade union movement on economic and inequality. They talked about, you know, the climate movement and environmentalists. They talk, brought uh, uh, feminists. And they didn't talk about just saying, what did they say? This is not about the 30 pence or 30 cents about the, the traffic, um, about the subway increase. This is about 30 years of neoliberalism. How do we reimagine a different Chile? I think we've got to be able to have that political education as, again. And, you know, often what we talk about sounds so radical. And I'm always reminded that if you go back 71 years ago and look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights sets out all of these things that people would have the right to education, health, they'd have the right to work, they would have right to housing. They, they set out a framework. And of course, our ability, our ch challenges in 71 years, we've never been able to deliver that for the majority of the world's population. So power and building power has got to be a very central part of any conversation we have around the Global Green New Deal or around what, kind of, what transformation is coming in the future. And we here in the UK have got the the responsibility in the year coming forward. In 2021, the UK will host the COP26 climate summit, right? The most important summit we've had since Paris. We're heading towards at least three, four degrees, up to seven degrees warming in the world. Uh, that's really, really important. But the UK is also hosting the G7 summit. So this is a moment where we've got to bring the economic mm -hmm. inequality fight and the fight about what the global recession and the recovery with the climate fight, we have to build the movement of movements so that we're not no longer fighting in silos, that our movements are coming together and standing in solidarity with each other, but not just here within the nation state, but globally as well. Thank you, Assad. Thank you. John, would you like to say a few final comments? 30 seconds, um, two things. Um, look, we have to recognize we've got responsibility on all our shoulders. There's been 200 people here um, listening to, to this conversation, which is fantastic. But, every Zoom meeting I've been doing, uh, the numbers turning out are absolutely enormous and particularly around environmental issues. And um, Assad um, did one, you, Assad, you did one with Naomi Klein and Andrew Roy the other day. There was unbelievable numbers turned out for that. And I just think there's really interest. So there's a responsibility on every one of our shoulders now to do two things. One, while we're still in lockdown, to use that time to prepare ourselves for winning the arguments. So that means involving ourselves in these discussions, webinars, reading, making sure we get all the information because we've got to win every argument now. That's the first thing. We've all got to become cadres, if you like, in this campaign. And the second thing, get ready. Get ready for action. Because when the lockdown starts ending, I tell you, there will be action. And there'll be action in terms of people coming together in face-to-face -face meetings, in conferences and discussions. There'll be action in terms of people demonstrating and there'll be action on picket lines. Because I think people realize things have got to change. So prepare, use this time to prepare, but get ready and be there when the call comes out after the lockdown ends. Thank you, John. Um, and thank you to um, all of the speakers. We, we run over time, um, but um, take the advice that we've got in the, the chat. Um, but I thought it was an excellent discussion and the fact that we talked so much uh, says there is so much to be said. I just want to finish up on where, where John left off um, and perhaps just to tweak it a little bit, because I think that we have to begin that process of campaigning now. Um, I really like to advocate that people in their local areas bring these conversations together, get the same groups of people that can speak on, on Zoom calls and start planning locally because we have to start organising locally and we have to make sure that um, very speakers mentioned it, the, the question of growth, yes we want to move away from growth but capitalism creates insecurity around the lack of growth and we have to make sure there is no ability of those in power to be able to exploit that huge insecurity that people will feel in in these circumstances so it is about alternatives it is about saying that we don't need to go back 
to what we were doing uh, before, that these are the alternatives. And it is about building those mobilizations on the ground that can deliver. And if we can reach deep into communities and into working class communities, this is the basis on which we can actually do the things that people have spoken about. I think we, we don't begin that work now in the much better circumstances that John spoke about, then actually we, we limit our opportunities to be able to grab this absolutely crucial historical uh, historical moment, not just as an opportunity, but as an absolute necessity, as an absolute necessity. We do have a world to win uh, and we clearly absolutely have a world to lose. Um, so thank you to all of the speakers um, today. Absolutely grateful for your fantastic contributions. Let's get organised, let's get organised on the ground and let's build that resistance and those mobilisations that we need to deliver real change. Thank you to all of you and look out for thank the you. webinars organised by the Climate Change Trade Union Group. Thanks everybody, thank you. Thanks.